The Mona Lisa is simply the most important single painting in the world. You have more than 8 million visitors per year in the Louvre and more than half of them are there only to see the Mona Lisa. Pour la Joconde, donc que vous appelez Mona Lisa, euh, c'est un tableau qui est qui, qui possède une telle présence. Questo sorriso è una una caratteristica che lo rende così così affascinante. There are a lot of uh, suspicions about the, um, the authenticity of the other paintings by uh, Leonardo here in the Louvre. All the Mona Lisa was always considered an original by uh, the artist. Leonardo da Vinci considered it one of his favorite paintings because he carried it around with him for so long. She has been coveted and loved, she's been written about, she's been adored. She had been taken, she had been kidnapped. This was the greatest art heist in modern times. This painting had an iconic value, but it was the very fact of the theft that transformed it into the equivalent of a kind of global celebrity. Paris newspapers reported the theft under the headline of unimaginable. This was huge, huge news all over the world. The police were virtually clueless how this had occurred. What audacious criminal, what maniac collector what insane lover has committed this abduction? It's somebody who's got some screws loose in their head. This masterpiece had been taken by an obscure individual. Non mi torna mai tornato questa faccenda qui. Come mai ha fatto questo? And it's amazing to think that for two full years more, it was gone. For two years, it was really gone. My name is Joe, and I'm obsessed with the theft of the Mona Lisa. I was 25 years old when I found out the painting had been stolen, and I spent more than 30 years trying to figure out how the man who did it, did it. It all started when I opened this book and read this sentence. On August 21st, 1911, an Italian mason, Vincenzo Perugia, stole the picture to take to Italy. Really? An ordinary workman stole the most famous painting in the world? Look at this guy. How could such a nebbishy little guy pull off such a spectacular crime? As a somewhat nebbishy guy myself, I wanted to know that too. So I did what a nebbishy guy does. I went to the library. This was 1976, when you actually had to leave the house to get information. But there it was, the theft the police investigation, and the recovery of the painting. You see, I was just starting out as a writer, and I thought the theft of the Mona Lisa would make a great movie. And I was going to write the script. But the more I learned about the story, the more I realized there was a missing piece to it. Why did Vincenzo Perugia steal the Mona Lisa? Patriotism. Money. Crime of passion. Revenge. I think there are many possibilities here. Since nobody knew Perugia's true motive, I figured I could just make it up for my screenplay. In one version, he stole the Mona Lisa to win the love of his girlfriend. In another, two co-workers persuaded him to steal it. In a third, Perugia was convinced to take the painting by the ghost of Leonardo da Vinci. The years passed, and even though I did get to Hollywood when I was 41 as a television writer, I never managed to finish that script. Then one day, as I was searching for anything new about the story, up popped the name Celestina Perugia, Vincenzo's only child. That's when it hit me. Why write a fictional film about him when I could get the truth from her? So with the help of my Italian friend Letizia, I found Celestina's phone number and called her. It happened to be her 84th birthday. 
Buonasera, signora. Buonasera. Letizia, if you could translate, I'm very pleased to be speaking to her because I've uh, wanted to know about her father for such a long time. I told Celestina I was making a documentary. She agreed to let me interview her on camera. Vi aspetto con tanto piacere. My wife Justine and I flew from Los Angeles to Milan. We met up with Letizia and my small Italian crew, and we went to see Celestina. <laughs> His daughter lives in northern Italy, close to the Swiss border, in a town called Dumenza. It's where both she and her father Vincenzo were born. In the main piazza, we were met by Celestina's daughter, Graziella. Buonasera. Buonasera. Signora. So this was Celestina Perugia. She didn't seem like the daughter of a criminal. She looked and acted like the little Italian grandmother I always wanted. We met her husband, Amleto. Her son Silvio took lots of pictures and ate lots of cake. Finally, it was time to ask Celestina to tell me everything she knew about her father. I chiamo Celestina Perugia. Ho 84 anni, sono la figlia del ladro della Gioconda e siamo sulla via del tramonto. Perché sta piangendo, signora? Perché mi emoziono sempre. E poi, quando devo parlare del mio papà, io non ho avuto la gioia di conoscerlo. What? She didn't know him? Sure, she had pictures of her father, like this well-known image from an old newspaper. Yeah, that's the original. But she also had photos I'd never seen before. He looked like a respectable, friendly, family kind of guy. It's the last picture of Vincenzo before his death. Vincenzo Perugia died October 8th, 1925, on his birthday. Celestina was a toddler. E quel giorno lì, quindi io ero piccolina, camminavo. La mamma mi ha detto, vai incontro al papà, vai incontro al papà. E io sono andata incontro al papà. E lui aveva una bottiglia di champagne e i biscotti. E caduta ai miei piedi. Fulminato da un infarto. Aveva 44 anni. Se suo padre fosse qui oggi, che cosa gli direbbe, che cosa gli chiederebbe, che cosa a suo padre? Tutto. Nearly two years after Vincenzo Perugia died, his widow remarried to her late husband's youngest brother, Ernesto. Quando moriva uno, il fratello sposava la vedova. Era un'usanza del, del tempo. Celestina grew up raised by her mother and stepfather. But no one ever told her that her real father, Vincenzo, stole the Mona Lisa. I miei genitori non mi hanno mai detto niente. Mai. It's easy to understand. Prugi didn't come from a family of criminals. Lato furto. Ed era un disonore per la famiglia, che non volevano più sentirne parlare. At 18, Celestina began working at the city hall. Her co-workers would kiddingly call her Giocandina, Little Mona Lisa. Lei non ha mai chiesto il motivo? No. When she was about to turn 20, she was finally told the truth about her father by her future husband's aunt. 
e l'ha cominciato a dirmi la, non tan via che il, il papà aveva fatto quella cosa lì e, e per me è stato un shock perché non me l'aspettavo. As I wandered around De Menza, I noticed there wasn't a Prugia t-shirt or a Mona Lisa refrigerator magnet for sale anywhere. In fact, there was no sign the man had ever lived here. No Via Perugia, no Piazza Perugia, not even a Pizzeria Perugia. In the town hall, there was a mural commemorating the Mona Lisa's return to Italy. There's the Mona Lisa and Leonardo, but no Perugia. When I met the vice mayor of the town, a Perugia cousin, I asked him why there was no memorial to Vincenzo Perugia. In a luogo pubblico no. No, in a public. They asked to do that. He explained the law prohibits Italians who have been on trial from having a street or statue in their honor. Anche il parcheggio Dumenza volevano dedicarlo a lui e mio nonno. Non è possibile perché ha avuto un processo nella storia. Yet on a wall in the village square, you can see a memorial to another famous Italian, Mussolini. There was even this unofficial street sign. It read, watch out for falling Tony. Graziella said Tony was someone who got drunk and tumbled down this ravine trying to retrieve his car keys. The only place in Domenzo we saw the name Vincenzo Perugia was in the town cemetery. Celestina placed a headstone in his memory. But he's not here. He was actually buried in France. Let's talk about the, the theft and uh, why she thinks her father stole the painting. Allora, lui la, la faceva il decoratore lì al Louvre e, sai, i francesi continuavano, macaroni, invece di chiamarlo anche, non so, Perugia, macaroni, macaroni vuol dire macaro, perché i italiani mangiano tanta pasta, i macaroni, i macaroni. E lui era stufo di sentirsi sempre a dire macaroni, macaroni. E allora un giorno avrebbe detto sempre riferito, eh. Adesso lo faccio vedere io il macaroni. E lui voleva la rivincita contro i francesi a portare via la Gioconda. What would she like us to do in this film? Ecco, di, di far credere proprio che assolutamente eh, lui non l'abbia fatto per i soldi, che io penso nel mio intimo che facendo un gesto di quello riportandolo in Italia. Celestina believed that her father stole the Mona Lisa out of patriotism to return an Italian painting to its home country. But I knew there had to be more to it than that. I think the signora wants to know the truth as much as we want to know the truth. And there may be some things she won't like to hear about her father. La verità va sempre bene. Good, okay, good. Okay. I promised Celestina I'd spend the next five months finding out everything I could about her father. And then I'd come back to see her. Almeno prima da morire saprò bene la verità. That's all she wants. The truth. The truth. Eh? Yeah. The next day, I was laid up with a torn meniscus in my knee from thinking I was young enough to carry my camera gear alone. But it wasn't as bad as the foot I put in my mouth from the promise I made Celestina. How was I going to find the truth about her father when no one knows what that truth is? I've been going round and round with the same story for 30 years. He stole it for money, he stole it for Italy, he stole it for the hell of it, he stole it by mistake. Around and around and around and yes, around. Yes, because he's bad and the Mona Lisa can't talk. Yeah. End of story. All right, end of story. Turn off the camera. Justine was right. Perugia is dead and the painting can't talk. Shh. I had to do some real detective work. Luckily, I knew a real detective. Something that happened in 1911 and there's no physical evidence anymore and the people who were there were dead. Uh, are there any writings anywhere? There are. These are some of the magazines and newspapers from back then that talk about the theft. But they're full of contradictions and inaccuracies, not good for telling the true story. And in all the books about the theft, 
There's a lot about how it was done, but little about the man who did it. So I contacted a friend in Paris to help me get information from the Louvre. She knew two researchers who lived right across the street from the museum. They hit every archive in the city and emailed me 1,500 digital images of Louvre documents, police reports, photographs, and newspaper clippings. Okay, it's um, quarters, with a quarter to seven in the morning here on uh, May 15th, and I'm just uh, downloading a bunch of documents. Oh, wow. It's like I'm a kid at Christmas here. <laughs> These are the mugshots from Perugia's arrest in Florence in December 1913 for stealing the Mona Lisa. I've never seen anyone in a mugshot wearing a hat. My wife, Justine, was not impressed. I can't deal with all of this. It's too much information. And it's too early, and I'm in my underwear. Now that I had this steady stream of source material, I had to figure out what it all said. I tried doing that by typing sentences word for word into Google Translate. The audacious thief of the Mona Lisa is one of those foreigners who fell in Paris at certain times of the year. What? That, that well, that didn't work, but these people rescued me. My volunteer translators. They read the Italian and French documents in English. Over the next several months, these translations helped me piece together the real story of Perugia. I started at the scene of the crime. The painting disappeared on a Monday, a day when the Louvre was closed for its weekly cleaning. Most of the guards didn't notice the empty space on the wall, but the ones who did thought, En se disant, tiens, c'est bizarre, euh, le, la Joconde n'est plus là. Euh, ah, ben, probablement, euh, le photographe euh, a dû l'emporter dans son studio. On Mondays, the museum photographer often removed paintings to shoot them for postcards and catalogs. The next day, the museum reopened. The Mona Lisa was still missing. Around 11 a.m., a Louvre guard stumbled on the painting's empty frame on a service staircase. Là, c'est là, on s'aperçoit que le tableau n'est nulle part. On fouille, on regarde, et, 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 et c'est là que, que c'est. On se dit, mais c'est pas possible. Museum director Théophile Homo was on vacation. He left one of his curators in charge. Enfin, je suppose qu'il qu le pense, qu'il espère que le tableau est toujours dans le musée. Enfin, qu'il y a une explication idiote, mais que c'est une blague, que c'est une plaisanterie. Mais en même temps, il se dit là, c'est trop grave. Je ne prends pas de risque. Je vais voir le préfet de police. The prefect of Paris police, Louis Lapine, the man newspapers called the greatest policeman in the world, sent an army of detectives to search for the Mona Lisa. When the police arrived, museum staff told visitors the Louvre was closing early because of a broken water main. Et puis alors là, il y a une sorte d'angoisse énorme qui monte, qui monte, qui monte, parce qu'on se dit, mais on ne le trouve pas, on ne, on ne le trouve pas. Paris was rocked by the news. Paris was the capital of the world of Western art. And so the theft of the Mona Lisa from essentially a fortress in the center of the city, a lot of people were shocked and saddened. Crowds showed up outside of the museum laid flowers at the gate as though someone had passed away. And everyone was thinking the same thing. Who is the plunker who has done this? Is it one of the staff? Is it a, one of the guards? The reports of suspects came from all over Europe. Cops in Paris were alerted that the two men carrying two framed canvases were on a boat heading for New York. Special agents of the Secret Service, customs officials, were alerted on various elements that turned out to be nonsense. Police distributed 6,500 flyers with a picture of the Mona Lisa, so people would know it if they saw it. Mona Lisa in 1911 is not the Mona Lisa now. The Mona Lisa now is a global icon. Even the venerable Washington Post got it wrong. They published this picture as the Mona Lisa. Paris newspapers began offering a reward of 40,000 francs, no questions asked. And what this meant was essentially anyone could write a letter to their newspaper editor 
blaming their neighbors or their rivals at work. They wrote letters by thousands. It was quite a mess. But as the weeks and months passed, the theft was forgotten. Bigger and more important headlines took the public's attention away from the search for the missing masterpiece. Then nearly two and a half years after the theft, in Florence, Italy, the Mona Lisa suddenly reappeared. It was turned in by the man who stole it. Perugia was taking the Mona Lisa home. He expected bands, he expected medals. What he got instead were handcuffs. To make such a particular theft, to engage in such a particular venture, there have to be other reasons, there have to be unconscious motives. Luckily, I found the key to Perugia's unconscious, his psychiatric evaluation. After his arrest, his lawyers wanted a psychiatrist's opinion to help build his defense. And the man to do that was Dr. Paolo Amaldi. Paolo Amaldi was a very well-known psychiatrist. He was director of the mental hospital Florence, which was an incredibly prestigious job. Amaldi's report details the extensive mental examination he gave Perugia. And Dr. Amaldi arrived at a surprising diagnosis. Although Perugia didn't seem very emotional, he seemed to be, for the most part, a good worker and sincere. But he did, in the end, find him to be mentally deficient. Mentally deficient? To find out what Amaldi was thinking about what Perugia was thinking, I tracked down Dr. Amaldi's grandson, Paolo Sorbi. Growing up, Sorbi heard stories about Perugia from his grandfather. He and his wife, Sabina, are college professors and have studied the Perugia case. The actual word Dr. Amaldi uses in his report is frenastenico, which translates to half-wit. So now am I supposed to go back to Celestina and tell her that her father stole the Mona Lisa because he was a half-wit? This is my friend Nando De Stefano, owner of an L.A. pizza shop. Nando translated Amaldi's psychiatric report in between customers. In Trenzo Perugia is the first of other three brothers and a sister. All three of them, um, all of them um, are still living and mentally sane. Being the oldest son, Perugia left his home in Dumenza to strike out on his own at a very early age. At 12 years old, he went to work in Milano. And then he uh, learned the job of in Bianchino. In Bianchino, which is not the painter artist, but the, the, house the house painter. Perugia worked in Milan for six years. Then he did what just about every man from his area did. He left Italy. Florence was forse the main principal. Here in the Val du Mentino, but also in the countries here vicino to Luino. It was the situation that existed for centuries, the poverty relative to the economy of the zona. These countries were all countries of women because the women were gone. At the age of 20, Vincenzo Perugia made the biggest move of his life to Paris. Paris was a, a city of excitement and fun. To many people, you know, it was like the capital of the world, if there is ever a capital of the world. The car was now becoming widely used. The subway had opened. The movie theaters were there. It was, in every way, it seems to be a very modern city. In Paris, Perugia continued to work as a house painter, right up to the time he fell ill with an occupational disease. The intossicazione saturnina is due to presence of lead. So he got lead poisoning, right? Yes. 
In a 1902 book called Dangerous Trades, painters were at the top of a list of occupations getting lead poisoning. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, if you were a painter, you were still mixing uh, pure lead paste with linseed oil. The painters were handling and exposed to that paste and to the paint and had the particles all over their clothes. There was especially severe exposure. This was Perugia's second bout with lead poisoning. The first time, he went home to Dumenza for treatment. This time, he went here, the hospital La Roboisière. We found his name in the hospital records. He was there for 15 days. If you were treated for lead poisoning, you had lead poisoning of a severity that is rarely seen today and that any doctor would find horrifying. Exposure to lead can shrink certain parts of the brain, most particularly the prefrontal cortex that is involved with decision-making and long-term planning. There's a lot of evidence showing a strong link between lead exposure and criminal behavior. If lead poisoning can cause criminal behavior, maybe this would explain why Perugia had two prior arrests. June 1908. Perugia was in the French city of Macomb, on his way back to Paris. While he waited for a connecting train, he had a meal with a little wine. Going back to the station, he saw some kids rolling terracotta pipes down the street. Vincenzo Perugia he stopped himself to, to, um, to, to say to these guys, hey, what are you doing? What is that? As the kids ran away, Perugia picked up the pipes, but intoxicated, he dropped one. Some passersby saw him and shouted, thief, Italian. In the meantime, the police came. For the first time in his life, Vincenzo Perugia was arrested. The charge attempted theft. Le 24 janvier 1909. Okay, it looks like on uh, January 24th, uh, 1909, around midnight, Place de la République, uh, he met a prostitute by the name of uh, Abel Kaufman. He said that he was coming out of a bar, and all of a sudden, this woman, you know, started to say, "Hey, what do you want to do? You want to come with me?" Da, 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 da. But he didn't feel like he wasn't in the mood. That's what Perugia told Dr. Amaldi. But the woman told the police and the press a completely different story. The woman got afraid, and uh, as she turned around, he hit her on the neck. He hit her on the neck. Even worse, he took out his pocket knife. But in the court documents we found, I discovered that Perugia was charged with carrying a weapon and not having his immigration papers. But he sa it says nothing about uh, him assaulting Somebody. Nevertheless, he was sent to jail for eight days. Now maybe Perugia's behavior was caused by his exposure to too much lead or to too much alcohol. But to him, these two arrests had a simple explanation. They were certainly linked in Perugia's mind with hatred of Italians in France. Well, certainly the Italians were the single biggest immigration group in the city of Paris around this time. Ce sont des, des ouvriers très intelligents, très habiles, mais et qui sont ici très mal considérés parce que ce sont des étrangers. Ils parlent mal le français, ils n'ont pas appris à l'école et on les on les considère comme des moins que rien. The Italians at that point in history looked as though they were going to side with Germany and they would go to war against France. So by association, Italians were guilty. And there were lots of people in France who just didn't like anyone from Italy. Perugia came face to face with this prejudice when he found work with a company named Gobier. Although his bosses considered him to be a fine craftsman, his French co-workers harassed him. In fact, Perugia was called Sal Macaroni, dirty macaroni, dirty Italian. That's exactly what Celestina told me. And this seems to have informed his psychology and made him, to a certain extent, in Amaldi's mind, a paranoid. And that this showed up in the fact that he took such offense to insults by the French. I could never understand how a mentally deficient immigrant with a criminal record got a job at the Louvre. Well, it happened because of this. 
Two masterpieces slashed within two months of each other by two mentally ill people. Security at the Louvre became the joke of Paris. One of the newspapers had a proposal that the following notice be placed in all French museums. For the safeguarding of the precious objects, the public is requested to wake the guards if they are found to be asleep. Journalists uh, who were concerned about the system of security actually made off with pieces of art to show this is possible, let's get serious. The way the Louvre got serious was to team up barking dogs with the night shift guards and to put the major masterpieces behind glass. Perugia's employer, Gobier, had the contract to do all the glass work in the Louvre. Normally, they fixed windows and repaired skylights, but now the museum called upon the company to help cover 1,600 masterpieces. Perugia was one of only five men entrusted to cut and clean the glass. As he worked, something piqued his interest. We heard from everybody that there was an enormous amount of paintings. They were from uh, Italian painters. Perugia didn't understand why all this Italian art was in a French museum. So he asked the Louvre's picture framer, Pavard. Monsieur Bavard would never answer him and always have done like a little, hmm, you know, a little smile, like, how do you say in English, uh, you know, when... Uh, Smirk, exactly. A little smirk says, oh, you fool, you know, you don't know why. Then one day, Prugia found out why. While he was waiting to start the job, he took a book and he started to look through. And he saw in one of the pages this uh, caravan of paintings, statues that were coming from Italy, looted by Napoleone I, Napoleone I. When Napoleon conquered a country, he stripped it bare of its art and sent it all back to Paris. To Napoleon, Italy was one-stop shopping. Napoleon was still kind of a dirty word in Italy, because Napoleon really did a lot of damage in Italy. He left a rather bad trail, which 100 years later might still have been felt. All Perugia had to do is go into the gallery where they have the Veronese masterpiece, the Feast of Cana, and he could see it a gigantic Italian work of art that was stolen from a Venetian church and was never returned. I mean, there are still works of Napoleonic loot that are still in France. I was disgusted, and I thought to myself, if I can at least take one of these back to Italy, I would have done something that would be patriotic and good for my country. Or as Celestina said, Adesso lo faccio vedere io il macaroni. They say a criminal always returns to the scene of the crime. But in this case, it was the criminal's grandson. <laughs> Celestino was too frail to travel. But Silvio Perugia was more than happy to retrace his grandfather's footsteps. Eh, penso che... Sicuramente la situazione in cui si è mosso mio nonno non era quella di adesso. Vedo che è estremamente difesa il sorriso non definito e lo sguardo che ti colpisce dappertutto eh, ti attraggono particolarmente. Per due anni è stata a disposizione mio nonno, questo senz'altro. Ha fatto una buona scelta. We filmed on a day when the Louvre was closed. There were just a few workers in the entire museum. It was easy to see why Perugia planned to make his move on a Monday, the day the museum was closed in 1911. When I woke up, I say to myself, this morning, I'm gonna go this morning. At 6 a.m., Perugia got up, got dressed, and left his room in the 10th arrondissement, about two miles from the Louvre. Perugia had stopped doing glasswork at the museum eight months earlier. He had left Gobier 
and returned to house painting. I arrived at the Louvre around five after seven. I was wearing my white worker's blouse. I entered without nobody seeing me in the museum. This is the journey I've made my son when I entered da, da questa porta e salì per arrivare poi al Salon Carré. What rooms have you crossed to arrive at the Salon Carré? Perugia. I've crossed the first floor room that leads to the Grand Stairs. I climbed the stairs, then I arrived in the Salon Carré. I saw there was nobody. On a typical day in 1911, there were 166 guards. On Mondays, 12 in the whole museum. So Perugia was alone with the Mona Lisa. I wasn't sure that I wanted to take La Gioconda. There was Tiziano, Raffaello, Il Correggio, Il Giorgione. But I made my choice at the moment. Rumba La Gioconda semplicemente perché è più piccola di altri quadri più Esatt grandi. Esattamente. La Gioconda era al Salon Carré, era esattamente in questa posizione. Back then, she was just another painting on the wall, not behind any protective barrier, just simply hung on four metal hooks. Da lì è stata staccata da mio nonno, che poi l'ha portata in questa direzione. I took it without making any noise, and I walked slowly on the wooden floor. Essere uscito dal Salon Carré con il quadro, mio nonno è venuto in questa posizione. Perugia knew he had to remove the Mona Lisa from her frame. A nearby service staircase was where he planned to do it. Gobier's men used this staircase to access the glass roof above that part of the museum. But on that Monday, they were repairing the roof on the other side of the Louvre. I came down the small stairs leaving the picture on the landing. He hid it behind some student copies that were left there. I went to the end of the stairs to see if I could get out. Perugia knew he could use the door at the bottom of the service staircase to exit the museum. He'd get out even faster than he got in. But I found that door was locked. And with a screwdriver that I had brought with me, I began to try to undo the lock. Even though I was able to take off the knob, I was not able to open the door. But then someone came down the stairs. E pensando di essere scoperto, ha immediatamente sospeso, si è seduto e ha aspettato. If this was one of Gobier's men, he could have recognized Perugia. But it wasn't. It was a plumber named Jules Sauvé. He didn't know Perugia. When Sauvé came to open with his key, Right. He noticed that the knob was off. He asked me about it, and I said to him that I didn't know anything. The worker went out, and he locked the door again. So he was still locked in. He was still locked yes. in? Yes. Perugia couldn't escape the way he wanted to, so he ran back up the stairs and retrieved the Mona Lisa. He stripped off the paper backing and rotated the four metal clips that held the painting in the frame. Like many Italian Renaissance paintings, the Mona Lisa isn't on canvas, but on wood. Removing the panel wouldn't have taken very long, according to the conservator in charge of the Mona Lisa. Aujourd'hui, pour décadrer la Joconde, euh, il nous faut euh, une minute. Hein? Perugia hid the frame behind the other canvases and took the Mona Lisa back into the museum through the same door he entered. He couldn't be seen carrying the painting, so he needed to cover her up. Here's how many people think he did it. He slipped it supposedly under his smock. But I doubt that. My daughter Julie is five foot three, roughly the same height as Perugia. And this is what it looks like to try to put the Mona Lisa under a smock. Instead, here's what Perugia did. Took off his smock, wrapped it around the painting, tucked it under his arm, and walked out of the museum the same way he came in. I felt very calm and very happy to do what I was doing and to be able to bring at least one of these beautiful paintings back to Italy, to my country. 
I got out of the Louvre around 7.30 in the morning. Coming out of the Louvre, I remembered that I had the doorknob in my pocket. I threw it in the ditch between the fence and the wall of the Louvre. I saw a bus pass by and I got on it. I immediately got off because I realized that bus was not going to take me home. Then I jumped into a horse-driven cab. I asked the, the driver to take me directly to my house. From the moment the theft was discovered, the best police minds in Paris were hard at work trying to solve the case. You walk into an investigation, and as a detective, you have no clue who, who did this crime. Okay, you have no idea. It could be anyone in the world. One of the first suspects police had was a mysterious young man museum guards often saw staring at the Mona Lisa. Perhaps someone had fallen in love with the painting and, and you know, couldn't resist. It, it made sense, given the Mona Lisa as a kind of original sex symbol in Western art. I can't tell you, I don't know what to say about the the vol de la Joconde, c'était les, les étrangers. Foreigners like the Germans. What better time than to blame it on the Germans, uh, who were about to start World War I? Many people thought that it was stolen by Americans because a lot of wealthy Americans were buying a lot of European art. J.P. Morgan being the foremost of them. Yeah, and that it had left France. One of the theories circulated was that the Mona Lisa was to be found in a luxury apartment in Manhattan. But we haven't even talked about Picasso. Yep, Picasso. Spanish-born Pablo Picasso and his Polish friend Guillaume Kostrovitsky, better known as the poet Apollinaire, were both brought in for questioning. Picasso had used stolen statues from the Louvre as models for his most important painting of this period, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Picasso didn't know the statues were stolen. He had bought them from the thief, a man who had been an assistant of Apollinaire. Guillaume Apollinaire was brought in for questioning and she spent a week in jail. Oui, nous, on voit le poète, mais la police voit l'étranger. Et elle est persuadée, Apollinaire fait partie d'une bande internationale qui a volé la Joconde. Et Picasso se, se défend en disant que, bon, lui n'est pour rien dans cette affaire. Et pour enterrer l'affaire, il fallait faire restituer au Louvre les sculptures, ce qui a été fait. The police thought they finally had a break in the case when they discovered there were two eyewitnesses. The first was Sauvé, the plumber who saw Perugia in the staircase. But here's how Sauvé described the man he saw. He seemed to be tall, 5'3", <laughs> with hair and beard red. Red. Then a shop clerk named André Bouquet came forward. He saw a person who was carrying a package. That was Perugia carrying the Mona Lisa. He was throwing something. And that something was the doorknob. Bouquet was across the street and behind Perugia, so he couldn't describe him, but he said he wore a hat. Most people are not trained to observe like uh, police officers. That's what police officers are trained to do. But the biggest clue the police had was something else Perugia left behind. Ses empreintes sont sur la vitre. The fingerprints were found by noted French criminologist Alphonse Bertillon. Verdillon was the one who founded some of the modern methods of identification. Most of the prints were smudged, but one was clear enough to read. And even though the police had Perugia's prints from his previous arrest in their files, they didn't match it. I asked a fingerprint expert from the Los Angeles Police Department to compare the prints from Perugia's 1909 arrest with the latent print found on the glass that covered the Mona Lisa. The latent print is one and the same as the left thumbprint. They are the same individual. We know now it's the left thumbprint, but Bertillon couldn't determine which finger the print was from. He had 750,000 criminals on file. They would have had to have pulled every single card to have gone through that. 
on each one, you've got 10 fingers or 10 prints. Bertillon would have had to have made up to seven and a half million comparisons to match Perugia's prints. It's overwhelming. So Bertillon started taking the prints of everyone with access to the Louvre at the time of the theft. 257 names were on his list. Tout le monde est obligé de mettre les doigts dans l'encre, les ouvriers, les conservateurs, les copistes. Even Hamol, the head of the museum. But there were no matches. So police then called in Gobier's glass workers to be fingerprinted. They all showed up, except Perugia. This was Perugia's neighborhood in Paris, at the time, the Italian ghetto. He rented a tiny room at 5 Rue de l'Hôpital, San Luis. Ora andiamo lì a vedere dove, dove era questo numero 5. There we go. Number 5, the address for the entire block of flats. Which room was Perugia's? I'd have to ring doorbells all afternoon. Bonjour. But then, this woman told us she lived in Perugia's apartment and that we could see it in a little while. Could we really be this lucky? <laughs> but as we were waiting, oh, part of a window fell from an upper story, just missing us. Maybe it's the ghost of Vincenzo. Bonjour. I took that as a message from Perugia. We were in the right place. Come in. More than 20 years ago, several rooms were combined into one two-story apartment this is the official police photo of Perugia's room. Were we really in the place he hid the Mona Lisa for nearly two and a half years? Sure looked like it. But where did he keep the painting? Alla, in un primo momento lo teneva sul tavolo di camera. Sul tavolo di camera. E quando mangiava lo imponeva in una legnaia. Ma cioè... non perché è un pazzo. So was the painting on the table when Perugia got a surprise visit from Inspector Brunet of the Surete, the French FBI? That's what Celestina thinks. Allora, lui è andato lì dal mio povero papà, cercon di qua, cercon di là, tutto dappertutto, ha fatto il verbale, che la gioconda non c'è, firmato dal prefetto, sulla gioconda. Funny, but false. In the Paris archives, my researcher Stefan found a new cache of documents. Inside of it, there's almost everything that's about the case. All right. One of the items was the actual police drawing of Perugia's 9 by 16 room. And I saw there was originally a closet next to the room. In fact, you could see into the closet from a window over his bed. And this is where Perugia said he hid the painting. The painting was where I kept my wood for the fireplace. So why didn't Brunet find the Mona Lisa? Because he didn't bother to look. When the policeman came into my room, I was dining. I was uh, having dinner. The policeman, you know, he interrogated me and I gave all the answer. And then he went, he went away. That's it. Brunet could have solved the case right then and there. He knew about Perugia's two arrests for attempted robbery and carrying a weapon, but he wasn't interested enough to take Perugia's fingerprints. So the French police were never able to connect the dots. They couldn't imagine that it could have been stolen by a humble house painter. They were looking for someone different because of their fantasies about the kind of person that would steal the painting, and that got in the way of proper police work. The police were following investigative techniques that can be found in a handbook that was popular at the time. It says there were two kinds of criminals, upper class, who plan their crimes and are non-violent, and lower class, who use weapons and are violent and brutal. The chief of the Sorite called these lower class criminals crappy low. Police believed the Mona Lisa was stolen by an upper class criminal. It couldn't have been Perugia, he was crappy low. Even today, there are people who think Perugia couldn't have been the brains behind the crime. That's why you'll see this name popping up as the man they think was the true mastermind of the theft. He was the Marquis de Valfierne. This was a man who was shrouded in mystery and still is, but he was such a delicious con man. 
The story goes that Val Fierno had a forger make six perfect copies of the Mona Lisa that he sold to American millionaires who thought they were buying the original. Perugia, he was just a patsy hired to commit the theft. And according to Val Fierno, the only purpose in stealing the Mona Lisa was in creating international headlines, which he did. The origin of the story was an article published 20 years after the theft in the Saturday Evening Post. It was written by an American journalist named Carl Decker. Decker got his training as a newspaper man under William Randolph Hearst. Hearst journalism was very sensational. It was journalism where you couldn't tell where fact left off and fiction began. We spent months researching Decker to see if his Val Fierno article was fact or fiction. And what I found is where Decker may have gotten his story. I think he lifted it from accounts of other criminals of the day, like a con man who sold bogus art to American millionaires, and a big time crook who was suspected of trying to sell a forgery of the Mona Lisa. Sound familiar? And Decker didn't even bother to check the facts he used about the masterpiece. He said the painting and its frame weighed nearly 220 pounds. No, the tableau de la Joconde, c'est un tableau en fait très léger. J'ai déjà pris dans mes mains, euh, avec le cadre comme euh, sans le cadre, et très facile à apprendre. Hein. And what about those six forgeries? That's one of the main reasons for not believing the story. It's almost 100 years later. Where are these six copies? I asked a professor who studied Decker if we can believe this story. Journalists often say, does it, does it, does it, does it pass the sniff test? Does it pass the smell test? Uh, it's, it's an entertaining story, for sure. It's a detailed story. But in the end, is it plausible? Is it likely? I don't think so. I agree. The facts show that Perugia was the true mastermind of the crime. And Val Fierno? I think Carl Decker simply made him up. I kept on working, not thinking about going back to Italy anytime soon and hand over the painting, because I wanted to let some time go by and have the memory of the theft fade. So Perugia let two years, three months, and 17 days go by. Nobody said to him, you're going to take this and hide it under your mattress and sit on it for two years. He did this day by day. In my experience, it's exactly what happens. Then Charlie Hill told me the story of master thief Adam Worth, who stole Gainsborough's The Duchess of Devonshire in 1876. And he carried her around in a suitcase for 25 years. So in the scheme of things, Perugia didn't have the Mona Lisa all that long. What the hell was he doing in those two years? Uh, did he ever take it out to look at it and, uh, and admire it? Or did he ever show it? Well, he couldn't have shown it. Turns out, he did. I showed the painting to Lancelotti only. He showed the painting to Lancelotti, Lancelotti. only? Lancelotti. Is that what he said? Yeah. Vincenzo Lancelotti was an immigrant house painter from the same region of Italy as Perugia. Lancelotti era un amico di mio nonno con cui eh, suonavano tra l'altro. C'era una, una amicizia profonda. Suonavano assieme, vivevano assieme, avevano le stesse donne e così via, insomma. Quindi era un po' un mondo molto legato. Perugia counted on Lancelotti so much he claimed that he let his friend keep the Mona Lisa for six weeks as he built a custom crate to hold his treasure. My son Justin and I built a crate that matched the description of the one Perugia built. It was a lot bigger than I thought it would be. A crate this big and room as small as his? It's no surprise that somebody saw it namely Perugia's girlfriend. I had, as a lover, somebody whose name was Matilda. After his arrest, French newspapers reported he fell in love with Matilda because she looked like the Mona Lisa. Yeah, if the Mona Lisa was a blue-eyed blonde who wore a headband, because that's what Matilda looked like. She was a German from the Alsace region. She declared to have gone a dozen of times in the room of the Rue de l'Hôpital Saint-Louis. So she visited him. And on one of those visits, she saw the crate. 
I noticed a crate in white wood. And I told him, ha! <laughs> that once married, I didn't intend to keep it. Well, there was no marriage. In fact, Matilda dumped him after finding letters from other women in his room. Eventually, she left Paris for good. This is Cottero, Italy. Even though it's just a few miles from Perugia's hometown of Dumenza, they have a whole different take on the theft of the Mona Lisa. Yep, the folks in Cottero give Perugia's close friend, Vincenzo Lancelotti, credit for the crime. Graziano Balinari is a restaurant owner and local historian. He's as passionate about Lancelotti as he is about his meat sauce. This is the real ladro. He was a decorator fantastic. Il mondo pensa che il Vincenzo Perugia sia il... Sì, no, tutto il mondo. Ah, infatti... I lancelotti non sono quasi mai, insomma, non sono no, mai... No, no, non sono mai sempre, sono stato io il primo. Paolinari claims that Perugia was hired by the Lancelotti family to be the fall guy. Chiamano il Perugia e le dicono ti diamo 10.000 franchi francesi e vai a vendere la Gioconda e ti fai arrestare e dici che sei il ladro. Ecco, lui si dichiarerà ladro sotto ordine a pagamento. And Balinari is no fan of Celestina. Dall'altra parte la signora Celestina Perugia che si è creata la storia prima di due anni. No. Sì, frottole, tutti, bugie. I think it's a commercial situation. Per creare una fonte di turismo, il ristorante, cavalcare la storia della Gioconda, eccetera, perché se no... Balinari has been promoting his version for years. Qui quando l'ho detto in televisione, sono tutti i giornali mi hanno fatto le copertine di mezzo mondo, ma anche Stern. E qui c'è l'intervista, poi che la Celestina qui si ritira un po'. I thought Balinari's story was about as strange as the collection of antique underwear in the bathroom of his restaurant. They look washed. Then I met Marco Monaco. He's a Lancelotti relative. And he took us to the place where Lancelotti supposedly hid the Mona Lisa after he stole it. In un sottofondo di una valigia l'ha portata a Cadero, nella casa del papà, cioè nell'osteria del papà. Sì, questo era l'ingresso all'osteria. L'ha messa sul tavolo e l'ha coperta ancora con questa tela cerata ed è rimasta lì per quasi due anni. What? Another table? Marco took us to see it. The top doesn't look 100 years old, but underneath, it shows its age. Then he demonstrated how the Mona Lisa was placed with cardboard around it to make a flat surface. And they kept it on a table. I told the Lancelotti story to our friends at the Louvre. Oh, no, I can't believe that. The museum's senior scientist gave me an idea. You, you, can, you can test with another painting. <laughs> So I did, at Thanksgiving, and I didn't tell any of my guests. <laughs> at the end of the meal, I revealed my little experiment. Oh, are you kidding me? Look at that. Oh, that's amazing. I love the idea that the Mona Lisa was concealed on a table in an osteria for two years. I don't think it happened. And Vincenzo Lancelotti is the real thief? All the evidence is against it. I told Graziano Balinari that Perugia's fingerprints were found on the glass covering the Mona Lisa scene. Who says that? In the police reports. He never heard that before. If I was Perugia's place, I would have uh, awakened one morning and say, what the hell am I doing with this? I better give it back. On December 7th, 1913, 
Perugia had a farewell dinner at his favorite cafe. Feeling generous, he gave the waitress a five franc tip. He's got this painting. He knows if he gets caught with it, he's going to go to jail. It's going to be a bad time for him, and he needs to get rid of it. He let his friends and relatives know that he'd be leaving for Italy the next day. Vincent told us he had something very important to do that would bring him fortune, glory, and honors. So Perugia wrapped the Mona Lisa in cloth, then put her in the crate, covering her with a false bottom. Then he filled it with clothes, tools, even his mandolin. At the border, the box was opened, but no one saw that it contained the painting. Firenze, dove mio nonno arrivò ridare il quadro all'Italia. Questa era la sua intenzione. Perugia came to Florence to meet Alfredo Geri, a dealer in antiquities. I have never known Mr. Geri. I learned about him by reading the Corriere della Sera. Perugia read this Italian paper in Paris. He saw an ad for Geri's Florence Gallery. So I wrote him. I wanted to know what Perugia wrote to Jetty, so I came here. Siamo all'archivio di Stato di Firenze. We met with archive official Salvatore Favuzza. He brought us Perugia's file. Yeah. Egregio signor Jerry. Yeah, that's a letter. Oh, can you read it? Okay. Scrive Egregio signor Jerry. Abbiamo l'onore di portare a vostra conoscenza alla vendita del capolavoro vinciano, La Gioconda. Wow, right off the bat, he's talking about selling the Mona Lisa. Then on the next page, he unfurls the Italian flag. Vi saremo molto grati se questo tesoro d'arte ritornasse in patria. He signs the letter Monsieur Leonard V, as in Leonardo da Vinci. The day Perugia arrived in Florence, he went to Jerry's shop on Via Borgo Ognissanti. E qui è il 12. So che qua, eh, io sono la nipote della Gioconda, c'era il negozio dell'antiquario Geri. Lei mi saprebbe dire qualche cosa, qualche informazione? No, assolutamente no. Geri may be forgotten at his old place, but I found the 1914 magazine article that he wrote about his first meeting there with Perugia. At 6 o'clock precisely, Leonard came. I said to him, did you bring the Gioconda? Yes, I have, but it's in my hotel. But is it the real Gioconda? You're not fooling me? I'm just going to tell you that it's authentic. How much are you asking? 500. I finish his sentence and I say, 500,000 lira. Yes. In 1913, 500,000 lira equaled $100,000, or about $2,970,000 today. Back then, you might have called that, uh, uh, you know, patriotism. But today we call it ransom. By the end of the meeting, they had a deal. Perugia agreed to show Jetty the painting the next day. Then Perugia returned to his hotel to spend a last night with the Mona Lisa. In 1913, the hotel where Perugia stayed was called the Albergo Tripoli Italia. It was renamed the Hotel La Gioconda shortly after the newspapers revealed that Perugia had slept there with the painting. The owner knew a little bit about marketing. La camera in cui alloggiò il nonno era la numero 20. A plaque on the door said Perugia stayed in this room. Perugia spelled Perugia, con una sola G. Invece con due G. Camera piccola. Sul letto in cui dormì mio nonno nel 1913 per due notti. E magari saranno cambiati i materassi così, però il letto è sempre quello. 
la Gioconda e gli teneva compagnia. Lui si era innamorato della Gioconda. <ride> ah. The next afternoon, Perugia returned to Jetty's gallery. Giovanni Poggi, the director of the Uffizi, Florence's biggest museum, was there. Oggi che eh, per noi, per il nostro ambiente, è una figura mitica, è stato davvero un grandissimo soprintendente. Perugia escorted Jetty and Poggi to his hotel room. Allora, qui eh, mio nonno aprì la valigia. And he threw them onto the floor, all this junk, and then under the false bottom was the Mona Lisa. Il quale andò alla finestra in controluce per vedere bene e per controllare l'autenticità del quadro. Poggi said he wanted to take the painting back to the Uffizi for a closer examination. They examined it, there were a couple of other experts there, and they all agreed, there's no doubt about it. This is the stolen Mona Lisa. Bang, Perugia's under arrest and in shock. Nonno, nonno, Vincenzo, cosa hai fatto? Perugia was moved from his hotel to his new quarters, Morate Prison. Now Morate's old cells are being converted into shops, restaurants, and apartments. But back then, people didn't go there to enjoy themselves. Penso che chi si trovasse qua probabilmente avrebbe vissuto piuttosto male. E quindi in questo momento penso mio nonno così, con una certa tristezza. As Perugia sat in prison, the Italian people celebrated Mona Lisa's return. For the first time in 400 years, she was back in Florence. I'm not inclined to uh, glorify people who steal the Mona Lisa, but uh, Perugia did end up as a hero to many Italians. And it was Mona Lisa fever. Peddlers were selling all sorts of Mona Lisa knickknacks by the box load. And there were Mona Lisa advertisements, there were Mona Lisa hairdos, there was Mona Lisa clothing. People left love letters for the Mona Lisa. In questo momento siamo nella sala 28 della Galleria degli Uffizi, che è poi però l'ambiente dove appunto fu sistemata la gioconda di Leonardo. 30,000 people passed through the gallery in just four hours to glimpse her for just a few seconds. The ones who couldn't get in, right. After her week in Florence, the Mona Lisa traveled to Rome and was officially handed over to the French ambassador. È chiaro, all'inizio del Novecento, in un clima magari patriottico ancora particolare, può essere che qualche duno abbia accarezzato l'idea di di mantenere questo simbolo. Nevertheless, the Italian government did not for a second think they could actually keep the Mona Lisa. As we know, Mona Lisa was not actually stolen from Italy. It was never part of the Napoleonic loot. That's right. Napoleon didn't steal the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa very legitimately belonged in, in France. It had been bought by Francois I from Leonardo. Following a triumphant exhibition in Rome, the Mona Lisa was whisked away for a quick showing in Milan. On December 31st, 1913, the world's most beloved masterpiece returned to her Parisian home. The Mona Lisa was very famous when it was taken, but it was even more famous when, when it was put back. Molte persone in realtà avranno scoperto eh, dell'esistenza di questa opera anche in virtù di questo evento così particolare, grazie a questo episodio. Unbelievably, the fragile Mona Lisa was undamaged, except for an abrasion on her cheek and a scratch on her left shoulder. Could this man find those marks in the painting? Pascal Cott is an optical engineer and founder of Lumiere Technology. In 2004, he made super high resolution scans of the Mona Lisa. Ah, ça peut être ça. Mais bon, c'est très très peu visible. Hein? And the abrasion on the cheek? Ça, ça pourrait être ça, ouais. C'est très profond dans la couche de peinture, ça. Donc c'est pas en surface. 
Perugia a dû plutôt euh, en prendre un soin extraordinaire. Great works of art have a way of casting a spell on people. And obviously this work of art cast a spell on this man. Vincenzo Perugia's trial began in Florence on June 4th, 1914. Molti italiani hanno difeso lui come campione dell'Italia contro la Francia e quindi si è trovato a essere non più un ladro ma un ladro patriota. The prosecution thought they had an open and shut case against Perugia. They were simply trying to argue that he was rational, he was in his right mind, he just wanted to steal the painting and sell it and make money and therefore he's guilty. The only thing I had in mind was to give a gift to Italy and I didn't intend to make any money of it. But the antique dealer Jetty testified that Perugia wanted 500,000 lira. And then the prosecutor brought up Perugia's trip to London the previous summer. Perugia admitted that while there, he went to see the art dealer Henry J. Duveen. I found this 1935 book written by a Duveen nephew. He said that his uncle Henry met a seedy looking foreigner who was trying to sell him the Mona Lisa. Who? Me? to offer La Gioconda to the English? Who says this? It's fake, it's false, it's a lie. When it was time for the defense, Perugia's lawyers played the only card they held, Dr. Amaldi's diagnosis of mental deficiency. From Amaldi's point of view, he's only partially responsible for his crime. He didn't have full control over his actions. He was very childish and misunderstood the legal consequences of bringing the picture back into Italy, showing that he really wasn't totally mentally competent. In court, the prosecutor disagreed with the psychiatrist's conclusion and said Perugia was fully responsible for his actions. Doesn't it take some degree of intelligence? to do what he did, to pull it off. So why would Amaldi say Perugia was mentally deficient if all the evidence was to the contrary? If Amaldi was sympathetic with his patriotic cause, this may have at least unconsciously uh, helped to form his opinion. And it is possible he inflated this mental weakness in order to protect Perugia. According to Amaldi's grandson, that's exactly what happened. My father was in the Party Socialist. Ecco. E, e quindi vede una ingiustizia dei lavoratori emigrati italiani e allora lo aiuta. Amaldi wanted Perugia set free. The tribunal disagreed. Ecco, questa è la sentenza. Viene condannato Perugia alla reclusione per una anni, uno e giorni quindici. Ecco. Vincenzo Perugia was listening the verdict He says it to the, the court. He had brought the smile of La Gioconda and so brought the smile on the face of the Italian people. I really wanted to return to Celestina with some proof that patriotism was at least part of her father's motive for stealing the Mona Lisa. And I hoped to find that proof in the Florence archives. Indirizzi sequestrati a Perugia. Oh, the letters to his father. Oh, the letters to his father. Can I see them? The letters had been seized from his parents' home in Dumenza shortly after his arrest. Caro padre, sono poi tanto a ringraziarvi di avermi mandato dei salami. Okay, some of the letters weren't very helpful. But in the ones written after the theft, we discovered an important clue. Che se resto lontano da voi, c'è un motivo, e questo è il mio segreto. Ecco. Here in his own words was the secret to what Perugia was thinking. Ma farò la mia fortuna e che questo arriverà in un colpo. Per il bene vostro ed è la fortuna di noi tutti. E il giorno verrà. And the day will come. Il giorno verrà. <laughs> the day will come. Yeah. Il giorno verrà. Pazzesco. Finally, we found a postcard Perugia wrote to a friend in Dumenza, just hours after he handed the Mona Lisa over to the Uffizi. 
He's already spent the money he thought he was getting on a dream vacation. No, vado forse a Napoli, Salonicco o Monastir. A Monastir. Ah, mamma. Lo c'era nel leggero, rimontando nell'Adriatico fino a Venezia. Voleva fare un giro. Però. Are you surprised about your grandfather? Sei sorpresa. Molto sorpresa. Should we tell your mother? Io penso. Lo dobbiamo dire a tua madre. All her life, Celestina Perugia believed that her father stole the Mona Lisa out of patriotism and because he didn't like being called macaroni. But now it was time to return to Demenza and tell her the truth. I was concerned about how she would take the news. After all, she was 84 with a heart condition. Oh, your heart hurts. Tell Signora that uh, we saw her father's apartment in Paris. Uh, I told her what we learned about her father's life, his lead poisoning, his work at the Louvre. One room, she now has and I showed her some pictures I thought she'd enjoy. Ah. See? Ah. Like his room in Paris. Bello. Silvio in the Louvre. Questa è la vera o le una copy? No. Oh, la, la vera. vera. A la vera. But then we came to the letters. Perché voi credete che io non mi ricordo più di voi e della casa, del bel paese dove io sono nato? No, o oh cari genitori, no. E appunto in questa Parigi, qui farò la mia fortuna o morirò. Che sperava di far fortuna con... Eh. Um, non oh. con il Super Enalotto, ma con qualcos'altro. Eh. O oh, farò fortuna o morirò. O morirò. Lì è la chiave del mistero. Eh, Questa sì. è la chiave, purtroppo. Non c'è molto dello sfondo patriottico. No, 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 do we want to do more? Sì, sì, possiamo. Miei cari genitori. As Silvio read the letters, Vincenzo's veiled promise of a fortune popped up in every one. E che abbiate a godere del premio che vostro figlio sta per realizzare per voi, che un giorno non lontano vi farò tutti contenti. C'è un motivo e questo è il mio segreto. I could see Celestina sink under the weight of her father's words. And I started to wonder if I'd done the wrong thing. Ricevete tutti un abbraccio ed un bacio, arrivederci se il vostro affettuosissimo figlio, Vincenzo. Oh, basta adesso, basta lettere. Va bene. C'è il furto da una parte, però lui ci vede il, il miglioramento della famiglia, il guadagno. Allora, digli tante grazie che mi ha fatto tanto piacere. Sono stato tanto contento. È contento? Sì, sì. Vincenzo Perugia didn't serve his full sentence. His attorneys filed an appeal. Riduce a Vincenzo Perugia la pena della reclusione, mesi 7 e giorni 8. Le Perugia si è immediatamente posto in libertà qualora non osti altra causa. Wow, they set him free. But Perugia didn't stay free for long. World War I broke out a few days after his release. He served in the Italian army, but was taken prisoner by the Austrians and held as a POW for two years. At the end of the war, there was no work in Italy, so he returned to Paris, this time using his actual given name. I francesi avevano detto che lui non doveva più mettere i piedi in Francia, invece lui aveva fatto i francesi ritornando col nome di Pietro e l'elogico è. With him was his young wife, he couldn't resist taking her to the Louvre. Quando lui ha portato la mia mamma davanti alla Gioconda, la mia mamma si sentiva tutta tremare dentro e ci ha detto, ma non hai paura che ti riconosca? No, no, lui ha detto, no, no, no. Ha detto alla mia mamma, marciranno le tegole dai tetti, ma il mio nome rimarrà famoso. Vincenzo Perugia lived the rest of his life in Paris, never committing another crime. He was buried in a Parisian cemetery in 1925. This was his gravesite.
But after 30 years, the cemetery needed the plot, so what was left of his body was moved to the bone locker. The cemetery attendant told me I was the only person to ever ask him to see the grave of Vincenzo Perugia. Moi, personnellement, après qu'on s'intéresse à une personne qui a volé la Joconde, je comprends, j'ai un peu du mal à comprendre, quoi. Mais bon, c'était un voleur, c'est tout, quoi. C'était un voleur. Yes, Vincenzo Perugia was a thief. What he did was wrong and half-witted. But to me, he was a man who was tired of a job that was making him sick. He hated being looked down upon as an immigrant, and he missed his home. He thought that returning the Mona Lisa to Italy would make his family proud of him and be a ticket to a better life for them all. I think many people can relate to a young man's wild dreams of fortune. I know I could. In a journal that I kept while I was writing my screenplay, I found an entry from 1979. I was around the same age as Perugia when he stole the Mona Lisa. It says, if I write the script and sell it, I will be rich. All I want to do is pay off the house and fix it up and have some money in the bank and some left over to do some traveling. So back then, I was thinking like Perugia. I wanted to make my fortune in one shot too. We just went about it in different ways. Before I left Dumenza, there was one last thing I had to do. I thought that if the town could remember Mussolini and Falling Tony, why not its most infamous son? On our first visit here, we were told there couldn't be a memorial to Perugia on public property, but we could put one on private property, like the house where Vincenzo Perugia was born. So here I was, finally at the end of this unimaginable journey. It began with Vincenzo Perugia being just a name in a book. And it ended with me actually helping his daughter understand the father she never knew. Bello. Tutta la troupe. And because of all of that, the Perugia family became like my family. Cello, hey! Oh, thank you. Con oggi chiudo la storia della Gioconda. Qualunque persone che verranno per chiedermi della Gioconda, io dirò ho chiuso, non voglio sentirne più parlare. Capito? Capito, Capito? grazie. Chiuso. Ecco, ecco. So thanks to Celestina, I could finally say something I waited more than 30 years to say. <laughs> the film is done. <laughs> Ricotta or just ricotta? Ricotta, ma ortica. Ortica is a plant, that poisonous plant. Yes. Oh, poison ivy. Yeah, poison ivy. We're having we're having ricotta wrapped in uh, poison ivy. Poison ivy. ivy. <laughs> I have a gioconda with my gaba, and uh, I came back to my house with a gioconda. <laughs> and what you say about him? He looks like a criminal here. Yeah, I think he looks like a criminal. When I was a kid, I remember that that whenever I seen him with the hat, I would say my father, "What's he, bad man?" So what, you don't trust guys with hats? No, I don't. <laughs>